Welcome to everybody this afternoon. Welcome to everybody this afternoon. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, this afternoon, good afternoon. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Hallelujah. I uh, just want to, first of all, say good afternoon, good evening, or good night. And uh, thank you for coming in the room once more. Um, I just feel the presence of the Lord already. Um, and I just want all of us to just reflect on how good he is. How kind he is. How peaceful he can be to those who surrender to him and who give him all of themselves. Amen. Well... Let me roll down this music and it's going to get into this text real quick. No, it's not a prayer shawl. This is a, a cloth. Just a, just a towel. Uh, yeah, it's not a prayer shawl. <laughs> but uh, let's get into the word this afternoon. Praise God. Psalms 119, we did. Oh, this is just a regular towel. This is like a hand towel or something. I just, you know, I just, I don't know. I just have it with me. But uh, let's get into the word. Amen. Uh, I don't know if it's a blessed cloth. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I just I just have it with me, honestly. But uh, let's get into the word this uh, afternoon. Let's go to Psalms 119. We started off with verse 1 through 8 early on this morning. And now we're going to go. Oh, no. <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, now we're going to go to the, the second part, which is the B section, which is verse 9 through 16. I don't know if we're going to get through all of this tonight because the first section, I didn't really put much notes down, but I really got some time to study uh, this afternoon before I got on here. And I have quite the bit of notes but I believe, you know, we're going to take our time and whatever we cover, we'll cover. And whatever we don't cover, you know, we'll just cover on the next scope. But before we uh, just actually just go th through it verse by verse, I just want to read through it uh, completely. It says this. It says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to your word? With my whole heart have I sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O oh Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in your precepts and have respect unto your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Hallelujah. Um, let's uh, go through it verse by verse now. <laughs> Looking at that ninth verse. Here's what it says. It says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? So here you have the, the psalmist, the author of the psalmist saying, um, how can I clean up my act? How, what kind of uh, way can I, what kind of thing can I use to aid me in doing things better? Living a more pure life, living a more uh, life, a life that is abstaining from the practice of sin. And he answers his own question. He says, by taking heed thereto to your word. In other words, the way that I'll be able to clean up my act is by re receiving the word of God. The way I'll be able to live for God is by receiving his word. Now, I just want to kind of break it down a little bit further. It says wherewithal. That word wherewithal means, it, it, the, def the, def the definition of that word wherewithal is the means needed to do something. So the wherewithal 
is basically the means needed, the tools needed to do something. So he's saying, what tool, what thing do I need as a young man? What, what, what can I use as a tool to cleanse my life? What can I use as a tool to become sanctified? What can I use as a tool to purge myself from impurities, from dirt, from muck, from sin, from mess, from all the stuff that I'm in? What, what tool can I use? And he answers the question by saying, by taking heed. That word heed means to pay attention to, uh, follow, uh, watch. So basically, the way that I clean up my act... The way that I get myself sanctified is by receiving the word of God, hearing the word of God, paying attention to the word of God, and following or adhering or obeying the word of God. Okay? And I have here written in my notes, the way we are cleansed from sin is by and through God's word. God's word is a cleansing agent. Maybe there's an area in your life that's dirty. Maybe there's a uh, a part of your life that has uh, remains of, of gunk and maybe it's hurt, maybe it's sin, maybe it's sickness, maybe it's poverty, maybe it's lack, maybe it's no joy, maybe it's fear, maybe it's depression. Whatever that junk is, whatever that dirt is, as you begin to listen to God's word, receive God's word, meditate on God's word and apply the principles that is written within the word of God, God will begin to clean out every a uh, piece of junk that has been implanted by the devil. He'll begin to clean up everything that has been dirty, that's been clogged up and stopped up in your life to bring forth the free flow of his blessing, to bring forth uh, the free flow of his pure anointing in and through you. So, we thank God for the word of God being the cleansing agent. Now, there's a couple of references that I want to kind of go to. First one I want to go to is John 17, 17, John 17, 17, praise the Lord God Almighty, and the word of God says this, it says sanctify them, which means clean them up, this is Jesus, he's praying to the father about his people, he's praying about the disciples and he's also praying about the future church, he's saying to God sanctify them. Clean them up through your truth. God sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So the only way that we can be cleaned, the only way that we can be sanctified, the only way that we can be set apart, the only way that we can be purified, the only way that we can be consecrated, anointed, and distinguished is through the truth of God's word. It's through the truth of God's blessed word. And of course, uh, another reference that I uh, want to kind of go to is Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. Give me a second till I get there. Amen, amen, amen. Ephesians chapter 5. Lord, help me to find Ephesians. And verse 26. Now, the context of this scripture is is talking about marriage. We know that. The context of the scripture is talking about husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself for it. Uh, but I really want to point out something here. Even though the context is talking about that, there's something significant that we should note. Verse 26 says this. In fact, let's go back to verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. Okay, that's self-explanatory. And gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it so he's you know he's talking about the example of Christ of course within the context of marriage but the example of Christ shows that Christ sanctified or he sanctifies cleansed or he cleans the church how with the washing of water by the word so the word of God washes you the word of God washes you it cleanses you it goes into your it goes through your flesh 
It kills your flesh, goes into your soul, cleans your soul, regulates your soul, renews your mind, changes your appetite, causes your spirit to become energized with the energy of God, and it conditions you as a righteous vessel for God. I like that right there. The Word of God cleanses you and conditions you as a righteous vessel for God, for God's honor, for God's use, and for God's glory. Amen? So that's important. How do I get this thing right? How do I clean myself up with the word? Verse 10. With my whole heart have I sought you. Oh, let me not wonder from your commandments. With my whole heart have I sought you. So he's saying here, God, I, I've sought you. I've, I've came after you with everything in me. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Don't let me get drift. Don't let me drift off from your commandments. Don't let me get distracted from it. Okay. Now I want to read these notes that I have written here. Uh, basically, uh, the first point that I made was the way we are cleansed from sin is by and through the Word. The second point I want to make is this. This is found in verse ten. Actually, there's two points. Uh, the first line has a separate separate point, and that point is this: seek God with everything. He says here, with my whole heart have I sought you. God wants our total worship. He wants our total praise. He doesn't want half-hearted devotion. He wants a total surrender of, of your heart, of your, your mind, of your soul, of your spirit, of everything. When you say thank you, Jesus, it should come from the deepest part of your being. Seek God with everything. Now, that word seek means to search, try to find, ask for. So, God, even though he is everywhere... God, even though he's omnipresent, desires to be sought after. He desires to be chased. He desires to be pursued. He desires to be uh, wanted, craved for, hungered after, thirsted for. God uh, gets, uh, and this is the best way I can put it, he gets joy out of the fact that you want him. He doesn't want to just be someone that uh, you need for necessary thing, but he's, he wants to be someone that you choose to want. You choose to desire. So God has orchestrated uh, things in the spirit so that it won't come easy. So that we will continually focus on him and continually want him. He does not want to be a, a, a do it your, your way, uh, serving you completely type of God. He wants to be a God that is needed and that is wanted just because he is God. Not just because of what he can do or what he can supply or what he can provide. But because he is who he is because he is God. So we have to get the mentality of God. I want you. God, I'm coming after you. God, no matter what happens in my life, no matter what blockages, no matter what things try to come up and pop up and what kind of confusion spells the devil tried to send my way, no matter what people say, no matter what kind of scales or rejection things try to come my way, no matter what kind of pitfalls try to come before me, I'm going to relentlessly self, uh, uh, initiate myself in a place where I'm seeking you constantly where I'm seeking you always let me let me say this here never let your search for God die out and never get comfortable in your search just because you found a certain aspect or dimension of God because along our way, as we search God, we're going to find out more and more about him. But don't get so comfortable in your collective present knowledge of God that you don't uh, tap into your potential knowledge of God. Don't get comfortable in your content, in your collective knowledge that you don't pursue the potential knowledge. Reflect on, meditate on your collective knowledge of God, but also pursue the unknown knowledge. Also pursue the potential knowledge. Because guess what? We're going to know God. We're going to, we, 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 we knew God. We will know God and we will continue to know him. We're knowing, we knew him before when we got saved. We're knowing him now and we will always know him. Because there's many different aspects of God. There's many different things that we have yet to learn about him. And that's the fun thing about him. We will always be learning something new about God. And it will all be backed up, of course, in Scripture. Amen. So we have to seek God. How? With our whole heart. Complete. Full. Empty. All. Focus. Don't get distracted. Complete. Give Him your whole heart. There should be nothing in your heart concentrating on anything else but Him. 
And that takes time to get to. Because even as we get into places of prayer, and even as we get into places of concentration on the word, and even as we get into places of worship, distractions try to come to hinder, tries to come to block, tries to come to dissuade, tries to come to pull down. But as we continue to bask in his presence, and we will lose touch of the reality of the physical, and we begin to embrace the reality of the supernatural, and he, he becomes more real to us. See, there's a benefit in seeking him with the whole heart. Because when you seek him with the whole heart, then he becomes holy. He, he becomes whole, he reveals him whole, his whole self. Whole heart seek, whole heart pursuit equals wholehearted revelation. Mm. Whole heart pursuit of God equals wholehearted revelation. So if you, if you want to know more of God, you have to seek more of him. If you want to know more of God, you have to seek him harder. Okay. Maybe it is the reason why we're not tapping into the, the greater, uh, uh, sensibility to God is because we're not completely giving our whole senses to him. Mm, that's a whole other topic right there. So we have to seek him with everything we've got. I want to go to a little reference here real quick. That's Isaiah 55. I hope this is making sense. And I hope that uh, those of you that are watching are enjoying, is enjoying this teaching as much as I've enjoyed giving it. Isaiah 55 and verse 6. And the word of God says this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. He likes to play hide and seek y'all. Call you upon him while he is near. So we have to uh, get in a habit of constantly pursuing him. It's almost like God wants you to catch him. But can I, can I, can I say this? You will never catch all of him. You will only catch him according to the parts that he wants to give you. See what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? So we have to continually to pursue and follow and cry out and go after him and stay close to him. That's what this next point is. Do not get away from God's commandments. Stay close to him because life will cause you to try to wonder. The scripture says, oh, let me not wonder from your commandments. Let that be your heart. Not only the other will I, will I seek you with everything in me, but I don't want to get away from your word. I want to get away from your law. I don't want to. I don't want to go off a different path and find myself floating around in space, confused. I don't know what's going on, drifting left and right. One minute I'm like this, the next minute I'm like this. I'm all over the place. I'm all over the map. No stability. No strength. No nothing. No. I want to know you, and I want to know your word. I want to be connected to you, and I want to be connected to your word. Okay, with my whole heart, have I sought you, Lord? I want to be connected to you completely. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. I want to be connected to your commandments completely. So I want to be connected to you, Jesus. And I also want to be connected to what you have said completely, holistically, solely. Not mixing it up, but complete surrender. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, verse 11 says this. Your word, talking about the Bible, have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against you. And of course, we alluded to this earlier, uh, your word, the word protects us from sin. That's the next point. The word protects you from sin. It protects you from sin and it endangers the manifestation of sin. It extinguishes any sin manifestation. The word extinguishes any potential manifestation of sin. So it says here, your word have I hid. In other words, I took that word and I put it in my heart. How do you hide the word in your heart? You meditate on it. You think about it. You dwell on it. And it becomes a part of you. It becomes a part of you. I put it in my heart. I put it in my heart. So that I might not sin against you. Notice it says that I might not. I'm not even going to give the devil a chance to try to make me sin against you. I'm not going to, I don't want to change sides. I don't want to insult you. I don't want to defy you. I don't want to come against you with my actions. I don't want to come against you by not doing what you say, by walking in disobedience. No, I want to completely and, and, and solely follow you and only you. I want to always be in sync with you. I always want to be in lockstep with you. I don't want to ever defy you. I don't want to ever come against you. I don't want to ever turn against you. I want to be with you till the end. Till the end. Sin makes you an enemy of God. But the word keeps you 
grounded with God so that you can remain his friend. Sin makes you an enemy of God. Because the word and sin cannot dwell in the same place. God and sin cannot dwell in the same place. When you sin, it's like telling God, I'm not following you no more. I've rejected you. I don't want to listen to you. When you sin, it's like slapping God in the face. So what the word does, the word is the glue for you to stick to God. The word is the glue that keeps man and God one. What is the word? Jesus Christ. So the word is the glue that keeps you and I close to him. Because there are forces. Come on now. There are forces trying to pull you. Trying to pull you out. Trying to pull you from God. Trying to pull you from what God has called you to do. Trying to pull you from the perfect will of God. Trying to distract you. Trying to trap you. Trying to make you fall into pits and, and, and the, the endangered areas. But the word of God is your safety. The word of God is your is your is your is your is your uh, uh, power the word of god is the thing that keeps you grounded in him hallelujah hallelujah i want to uh just kind of pull up some other references uh psalm 37 psalm 37 praise the name of the lord our god and king verse 31 says this, the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. So when the word of God is in your heart, you won't make a mistake. Because the word of God will order your steps. The word of God will govern your decisions. The word of God will govern your feelings. The word of God will cause you to be in lockstep with his testimonies, with his statutes, with his laws, with his judgments, with his decrees. You'll be in the perfect plan and will of God. The word of God negates you having to always hear personally from God. Because when you have the word of God, you'll be in the plan of God, even though you don't directly hear from him like you want to. But because you're following his word, you are walking on the path of righteousness. And therefore, you will end up in the right place at the right time with the right associations, with the right status as it relates to your relationship with God. So the word of God is a great security policy. It keeps you secure in God. It keeps you secure from sin. Mm. None of his steps shall slide. Psalms 40, verse 8. Here's what it says. I delight to do your will, O my God. Yes, your law is within my heart. Not only is the word of God a protection against sin, but the word of God is the, is the, motiv is the motivation and the source of obedience. The word of God puts the desire of obedience in you. It puts a desire of obedience and it produces the manifestation of obedience in the believer. I delight to do your will. In other words, I want, I like to do what you want me to do, God. I like to do what you told me to do. It's not just me doing it out of ritual and out of obligation. It's doing me out of want. It's doing me out of desire. It's doing it out of a, a place of delight, a place of joy. Yes, your law is within my heart. So when the word of God comes inside of you, it puts a drawing to want to be close to God. It puts a, 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 a almost like a red flag against sin. And it causes such a passion for obedience, a passion for supernatural following of his principles to come into your heart and to manifest in your life and daily actions. The word of God is the springboard upon which and by which we are catapulted into total obedience and surrender. Hallelujah. Now let's go to uh, go back to the main text and let's go to verse 12. I'm going to go through this rather quickly. Blessed. Remember blessed means holy, consecrated and happy. Are you, O Lord? So God is the source of happiness. He is the source of holiness and he's consecrated. He's separated. He's the sanctified one. O Lord. Awesome. It could also mean awesome, mighty, glorious. He's the source of all goodness. He's great. He's glorious. He's wonderful and splendor, grandeur and majesty. The all in all, powerful and sovereign. The authoritative one. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. He's saying, look, Lord, I recognize your authority. And I recognize your authority. And not only do I recognize that you are blessed and that you are wonderful, but I'm requesting that I be taught from you because I can't even understand this without you teaching it. See, so that leads me to my next point. God will teach you his laws if you desire and request and respect him enough to. First of all, you have to want God's word to be revealed to you by God. 
Secondly of all, you have to respect God enough to receive the revelation that he gives you from his word. You can't come up in there trying to fight him, trying to act like you know more than him because he is the all knowing one. We are the uh, we, we, we function from a finite dimension. God functions from the infinite dimension. So how can finite tell infinite what to do and how to do? How can creation tell creator what's real and what's not real? How can uh, a user of wisdom tell the source of wisdom what wisdom is? Come on now. So we have to recognize our uh, inability to understand the word of God without him. We have to understand and we have to recognize our inability to apply the word of God unless God himself reveals his word to us in a practical way where we can receive the strength of God to be able to do it in our daily lives. We have to recognize that we don't know anything. We have to come to a place of humble uncertainty that draws upon the knowledge of God and that requires God and that asks God and that presses God to constantly reveal himself in greater and larger and larger sums as we pursue him in the study of scripture. Now, teach, that means to show, that means to explain, that means to train, that means to discipline. Lord, I want you to show me some stuff. I want you to explain some stuff because I got some question. First of all, I don't know what this is. I don't know everything. I need you to show me. I need you to be my eyes. Explain. I can't think about this. My mind is not even functional on, this, in, on these levels. I need you to explain and clarify. Train. Help me to be able to walk this thing out. God, I need you to train me in my steps and my actions. Discipline me. Help me to stay on the path that you've called me to do. Because even though you have shown me and you've 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 real, you've trained, I still need uh, a mo a motivator, a coach, a tutor, a mentor, a overseer to be able to keep me on the straight and narrow so that I won't get off and I won't be distracted. Teach me discipline. Teach me his statutes. Now this is very important. It says, Teach me, teach me your statutes. Statues are written laws. There are oral laws, which is spoken, and then there are written laws. There's a difference between oral and written. Oral laws are laws that are spoken. Written laws are laws that are written. An oral law is here one day, gone the next. There's no proof that it was the law. It was just oral. It was spoken. It's the only proof of it was the the moment in time. But that doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, you know, it could it, it doesn't it doesn't hold that much weight. However, written law is different because it survives the people that spoke the law, and it stays on paper. So, basically, what the psalmist is saying, Lord, explain my word, explain your word. Your law is your word. Your written law. I need to know what this is talking about. Because I'm looking at this Bible. And I'm seeing the words in the paper. And it's written. But I need to know what you're really saying. Have y'all ever written the Bible? And it just. You read it. But it's like there's a deeper revelation. There's a deeper dimension. See when you read the Bible in your flesh. You see the written word of God. You see the written law of God. But the only person that can explain the written law. And the written word of God is God himself. Because God in fact is the author. He is the author, yes, and finisher of our faith. He is the one by which and from which the words of God came. Through the prophets, through the apostles, through the patriarchs, through the saints of God. Therefore, who better else to ask than him? For enlightenment, for discovery, for opening of understanding, for greater knowledge, wisdom, for mentoring, for ministering, for growth, for rearing, for refining, mm, for discernment. For greater impartation of true information from heaven. Now, we don't need to worry about learning on our own. Because God sent us a teacher. In the context of the New Testament, Jesus talks about this in John 14. And he said it was benefit, there was benefit in him leaving. There was something good about him leaving because he was going to send... Somebody else. And one of his job descriptions, you know, many of his job descriptions is just to empower and to help and to aid and to stand beside and to, you know, and to comfort and all that. But one of his job descriptions is to teach. To teach. But the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things uh, to your remembrance, whatever I have said unto you. 
So he will teach you the word of God. He'll remind you of the word of God. Okay? That's what he's going to do. He's going to teach you the word of God, and he's going to remind you the word of God. So he will not just teach in the moment, but he will teach through memory. He will teach and repeat. He will teach and remind. He will teach and keep in memory. Mm. The teacher. Some of us, were asking God for wisdom. We're asking God for knowledge. We're asking God for understanding. And God is saying, I sent you the teacher. I've sent you my spirit. Once you allow my spirit to breathe upon your, uh, your noggin, true enlightenment will come. True wisdom will come. True understanding will come. True and greater insight will take place. Amen. Now, verse 13. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of your mouth. So he's saying here, I'm, uh, I've spoken your word. The word of God must become your communication and memory. You have to speak it. You have to open up your mouth and speak it. He's saying, with my lips. With my lips, I have declared. Now, that word declared in the Hebrew means to speak, but it also means to recount. So, in other words, I have spoken and I've also remembered. I've also went over. I've also reminded myself all of all the judgments, of all the commands, of all the decisions that you have made according to certain topics of life. You know, I've reminded myself and I've spoken it from all the judgments of your mouth. Okay? So basically, this is this is I want to give an example with this because I believe this is really going to help. First of all, there is power in speaking the word of God. Because when you speak the word of God, you change atmospheres, you create the supernatural, you allow the heavenly reality to become the reality in the earth realm, you open up the heavens for God to activate things and to manifest promises. And not only that, but you keep your spirit in alignment with God. You fend off any kind of foreign spirit that would try to throw you off or cause confusion to come, get you out of the perfect alignment with God, and you allow yourself to stay grounded in the truth of God so that you will not be deceived. Those are several benefits of speaking the word of God. So, with that being said, and keeping that in mind, if I'm walking around, and I've been trying, and I've been speaking, I've been reading the word of God, and all of a sudden fear comes, when I begin to open up my mouth, and I begin to quote a scripture like 1 Timothy 1 and 7, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. Me just quoting that scripture causes me to remember what God said. It causes me not to just remember, but it causes me to speak. There's a difference between remembering and speaking. Notice I said the word declared means recount and speak in the Hebrew. So what I'm saying to you is this. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of your mouth. With my lips I am not, I've remembered and I've spoken. I've remembered and I've spoken. So basically, this is how the word of God works as it relates to speaking the word of God. A situation comes up or the prompting of the Holy Spirit prompts you to speak the word of God. And all of a sudden, a scripture comes to your mind. You pull up a scripture from your spiritual library, from the word of God that is within you. And it causes you to remember that promise, that spiritual truth, that spiritual fact that comes from the word of God. And that word, that promise, you rememberizing it, you remembering it, you recounting it, you revisiting it, causes faith. And that faith, once spoken, releases the power of change into your life and into the lives of everyone around you. Therefore, it's important to remember and speak. Remember and speak. Not your words, not your thoughts, not your ideas, not your persuasions and policies, but the word of God. I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. With my lips, I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. Not some. Not scriptures that are expedient to me, but scriptures that are, that challenge me and, and, and dare to try to refocus me. I don't want to speak. No, I don't want to, I don't want to remember. Or I don't want to concentrate on or I don't want to apply. No, I'm going to speak the whole counsel of God. I'm going to speak the whole scroll. I'm going to apply it. I'm going to speak it. I'm going to meditate it. I'm going to cause myself to come under subjection to it in every single way I can. So. God's word must be your main discussion and testimony. It must be your main discussion and testimony. I want to go to a reference real quick. This is Psalm 40. Praise the name of the Lord. Psalm 40 and verse 9. 
Here's what it says. It says, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. There he's in speaking. I speak, I preach righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, you know. So basically, this is a prophetic psalm talking about Jesus, but just to use it in the, in the context of the scripture and in the context of this conversation, he's been speaking, he's been preaching, he's been declaring the word of God, he inhaled it back. Some of us, the reason why we're not experiencing our breakthrough is because we're not speaking the word from the breaker, from the one who is the cause and the mighty uh, one who comes with breakthrough. So, sometimes your breakthrough is a word, a scripture, a way. We have to make the word of God our conversation. We have to make the word of God not just our conversation, but we have to make the word of God uh, our a confession, our testimony, our main discussion. Okay? Verse 14. We're almost done. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. So basically he's saying, the word of God has given me so much joy. It's given me so much contentment. It's greater than physical things. I want to read my notes here. It says this, the word of God will give you much joy beyond materials and intangible value greater than tangible assets. The word of God produces an intangible value of joy greater than tangible assets. In other words, the word of God will give you something that money can't buy. The word of God will produce the joy of the Lord. The word of God will produce the fulfillment of God. The word of God will produce the satisfaction, the contentment that comes and is found in God. The word of God will produce the peace of God. It will produce such a life in you. It will produce supernatural strength. Uh, Nehemiah 8 and 10 says this. Let me go to here real quick. Nehemiah 8 and 10 says this. Says this. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord, neither be you sorry. Here's the part I want to focus on. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. So, the word of God causes the joy of the Lord, which is the strength of God, to be released out of us. The word of God will make you happy. The word of God will make you fulfilled. The word of God will make you delighted. The word of God will make you uh, 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 satisfied. It will cause you to be excited about God. The word of God is a motivation for the fire of God. It brings you back on fire. It gives you that pep in your step. It gives you the energy that you've been lacking. It removes fatigue. It removes depression. It removes all doubt. It removes all fear. It removes all uh, wishy-washiness. It causes a stability. It causes a surrender and a smile to come on your face. It causes such a static energy to rejolt and revitalize and resurrect your spirit and quicken you to the reality of heaven that you have no time for sadness. You got no time for doubt. You got no time for fear. You got no time for anger. You have no time for bitterness, wrath, jealousy, malice, contempt, sadness. You have no time for that stuff because you are so overwhelmed. You are so filled. You are so filled to overflowing with the life of God, with the joy of God that all you want to say is hallelujah. All you want to say is thank you, Jesus. So if you need some joy, the word of God is, is, is a source of joy. If you need some peace, the word of God is a source of peace. The word of God produces the good fruits of God. It removes the negative spoils that the devil tries to implant within our spirits. And it causes a spiritual and a positive har harvest of good things. And it's so wonderful. Think about all the people that are sad in this world. All the people that are void, empty, dark, obsolete. Unsure, insecure, out of place, out of whack, distant, overcome by the pressures and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the spirits of this world. But one injection of the word, mm, one injection of the word will cause their reality and their frame of mind to change. All of a sudden, the sun, the sun will start shining. All of a sudden, they were sullen. They was down. They was out. But all of a sudden, happiness begins to become their portion. They begin to realize there is a greater uh, reason to live. Because they recognize that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Sometimes, all you need is a word to bring you a smile to your face. What is your spiritual problem? 
What is your spiritual prognostication? The word is coming to cure. The word is coming to heal. The word is coming to speak to that wounded soul, to that broken heart, to bring forth a cure to the ailing spirit, to the weakened sense of living comes to bring forth a spiritual triumph in your spirit that will bring forth and it will birth forth a praise that will birth forth a confession of glorious uh, trust in God. The word of God breaks off every spirit that tries to leach the strength out of you and it replenishes you. It remakes you. It remodels you. It revitalizes you. Revitalizes you. It upgrades you. It refreshes you. His word. Verse 15. I will meditate. In your precepts. And have respect unto your ways. So basically what he's saying here is. Lord I'm going I'm to meditate on this thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to muse on it. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to repeat it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to dwell on it. I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to study it. I'm going to ponder on it. I'm going to reflect on it. I'm going to meditate in your precepts. I got to figure out what you're saying. I got to allow what you're saying on paper to become a part of me. And not only that, but I want to have respect unto your ways. I'm going to consider your ways. I'm going to watch your ways. Not only am I going to take it within, but I'm also going to take it from without. There's a difference between what he's saying in the first part of this verse and the second part. The first part, it says, I will meditate on your precepts. That's when you sit before the word of God and you read the word of God and it becomes, it becomes, it goes into you. It goes into you. You process it. You dwell on it. You break it down. You receive it. You suck the life out of it. Every kind of nugget you can find, you, you pull out of it. You, 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 it's almost like you're on a treasure hunt to get the treasures, the, the, the gold, the value of it. Not just in your mind mentally, but ingrained in your spirit. But it says the second part, and have respect unto your ways. That's talking about not just uh, from the inside, but that's talking from the outside. In other words, I'm going to only look at those things that are concerning you. I'm going to have respect. I'm going to have priority to those things that celebrate your word, to your things. So that means when I'm sitting on at home and I'm watching TV, I'm having respect unto your ways when I watch things that is only godly and not things as nasty. That means when I'm at work, I'm not entertaining myself with gossip and crazy conversation because I want to have what? Respect unto your ways. I want to consider your ways. I want to I want to fix my eyes only on what you want my eyes to be on. I want to observe and watch those things that you would have me to watch and, 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 and to see and to witness. And that's why my my concentration is not just uh, holy inwardly, but it's also holy outwardly. Hmm. I'm not just focused and obsessed on your word from a spiritual or from a soulish or from a mental perspective, but I'm also reflecting and meditating and demonstrating and respecting your word in what I choose to entertain in my physical practices. What I choose to entertain in the physical around, the physical environment that I'm around, the physical information that I allow to come towards me. Okay, I'm going to be regulated. I'm going to regulate my surroundings through the word. The word of God is going to be the security checkpoint by which anything that comes through to affect me in my environment, in my life, in my physical ventures. Mm. Is the word of have you hired the word of God as a security for your physical life? Or have you allowed your feelings and your flesh to just let anything to just to just to just do whatever it wants? It's not enough to just receive it internally, but we have to also allow the word of God to be our focus and our main, main fixation on the outward. As it relates to our environment, as it relates to the information that we listen to, as it relates to the, the, the actions that we take and the attitudes that we put on, <coughs> conversations that we receive or entertain. Amen. Um, and then verse 16 says this, I will delight myself in your statutes. I'm going to enjoy your word. I'm going to enjoy it. I will never forget your word. It's so important that we never forget the word of God because the word of God is one of the greatest tools in our tool belt. We have to hold on to it for dear life. We have to meditate on it for dear life. We have to allow the word of God to become our constant 
constant concentration, never out of sight, never out of mind, always in our hearts. Never allow your day to uh, allow yourself to function in a day absent of a fresh word from God. That's how we live in Christ. That's how we breathe in Christ. That's how we have our being. It is our connector to God. I love what Psalms 1 2 says. It says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. We have to allow ourselves to meditate on God's word and to get fulfilled in it, to get strengthened in it, to get replenished by it, to get fed by it, to live by it, to never let go of it, but to always stand on it, make it the foundation and the spiritual standard of our lives. And just to conclude, this blessed broadcast, Joshua 1 and 8 says this. It says, This book of the law shall not depart out of, out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. He's saying the word of God will be in your mouth. You'll speak it. You shall meditate therein and day, day and night. You will think about it. You will observe it. You will do it. And when you begin to do these things, when you begin to speak that word, when you begin to observe or do that word, when you begin to meditate, when you begin to speak, think, and act the word of God, success will be your portion. So I just want to encourage you, those of you that's watching, make the word of God the fundamental priority of your life. Allow yourselves to be cleansed by the word. It might be an issue in your life or a problem. The word of God wants to cleanse you. Allow yourself to always seek God with everything in you. Never to get too far away from him. Always want to stay close to him. Because if you get far from him, sin will take you. But if you stay close to him through his word, sin can't touch you. Allow yourself to be taught of him. To learn from him. Because there are still things that yet we still have to understand. There are still things that we have yet to still discover. There are still things yet that we have still to discern and ascertain. And only he can teach us. And as we do that, we're going to be so filled with joy. As we meditate on the word of God. As we focus on the word of God. And don't get distracted. As we never forget his word. We will ensure our spiritual success, safety, survival and blessings. So, make the word of God your life. Amen? Amen. Well, I thank God for this. Uh, talking about, this is the Beth. Uh, we did Alpha earlier. This is Beth of Psalm 119. And I hope that you enjoyed this teaching as much as I enjoyed teaching it to you. May God bless you and keep you. And you guys have a wonderful night. Bless you in Jesus' name. Bye-bye.